tonight. Pandemonium breaks out at the Imo State House of Assembly as Speaker announces removal of the Chief Whip and suspension of six other lawmakers. While Senate screens candidates for appointment as INEC National Commissioners, controversial nominee Loretta Onoche denies being a member of the ruling APC. Three days after over 120 students of Bethel Baptist School were abducted in Chukwu local government area in Kaduna State, at least 14 people have again been kidnapped in this same area. And four suspects killed as manhunt continues for other persons believed to have been involved in the assassination of Haiti's president, Jovenel Moise. Plus, business, sports, news from Abuja, and later, international news from a London studio. On business news tonight, Federal Inland Revenue Service directs designated money banks to freeze and recover 1.8 trillion naira from accounts of multi-choice Nigeria and multi-choice Africa. On sports news tonight, world number one Ashley Barty advances to her first Wimbledon final where she will face Karolina Pliskova in Saturday's showdown. And from the nation's capital, Federal High Court in Abuja grants bail to former Registrar of JAM, Professor Adedibu Ojerinde, in the sum of 200 million naira. Kick things off in Imo State, where we heard sporadic gunshots and pandemonium at the House of Assembly earlier today, following the suspension of six lawmakers by the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Paul Emisium, over alleged unparliamentary conduct. The Chief Whip of the House was also removed. Four of the lawmakers are members of APC, and two lawmakers of the PDP were suspended. The lawmakers are former majority leader and member representing Ikeduru State constituency, Uche Wagu, member representing Obowo State constituency, Kennedy Ibe, and member representing Oru West local government, Dominic Ezeraha. Other are mem others are members representing Ezinite Mbise State constituency, Ayadi Kemosu, member representing Oweri North, Philip Ejogo, and member representing Ihita Boma, Onyemechi Njoko, the House also removed the member representing Idiato North, Arthur Egwim, as the Chief Whip of the House. Meanwhile, the Chairman of the House Committee on Information, Johnson Duro, is insisting the suspension of the six lawmakers is not political. But the Chief Whip, Mr. Arthur Egwim, who was also removed, maintains he remains the Chief Whip, and nothing to his knowledge was done to warrant his removal by the leadership of the House. The speaker gave me his wisdom, gave me, gave me uh, freedom to move my, my motion. After moving his motion, going to item, seven, item 8 in the other paper, only for him to say he has an announcement. And so then he said, uh, uh, all the whole, all the whole uh, uh, principal offices, uh, like committees, had been dissolved. Uh, the office of chief whip had been dissolved. Um, nothing like office, office of chief whip had been dissolved. Instead of saying the chief whip had been removed, they said office of chief whip has been dissolved. And that um, this is members. He made that started mentioning this member Kennedy, Ibe, the honourable member uh, uh, Jogu. Um, six of them that all these members have, have all been uh, suspended indefinitely because of um, uh, um, parliamentary um, activity. So we were like, what is happening? So before we knew, we started hearing gunshots outside. So everybody started there. Uh, campaigning for for safety. That's exactly what happened. The house has uh, protocols. The house has ethics. And then uh, if a house member is found, you know, wanting in any of those uh, uh, expected conduct of the member, uh, honorable member, you know, such, member, such house member is subject to disciplinary action. So we just resolved that it's high time we change the chief way. I wouldn't say he committed any offense. He never committed any offense. But we felt there was need to install a new 
person who could, you know, instill the expected discipline in the house. So that was why he was removed. So there was this premeditation that um, something like that was going to happen today. So the, the suspended house members came with some thoughts. And then this was towards the exit of the uh, assembly premises, you know. So in order to disperse them, so the security men had to release some conscious in the air. Then that was just why you had some conscious within the premises. So. In other news, the senior special assistant to the president on new media, Mrs. Loretta Onyoche, says she is not a member of the ruling All Progressives Congress and has had nothing to do with any political organization since 2019. Mrs. Onyoche made this clarification during a screening exercise by the Senate Committee on INEC for her appointment as INEC National Commissioner. Our correspondent, Linda Kigbe, has more. The nomination of President Buhari's aide, Mrs. Loretta Onoche, as a national commissioner in the nation's electoral body, INEC, has been fervently resisted by both politicians and members of civil society organizations. The grouse is that she is a card-carrying member of the ruling All Progressives Congress, and the position requires political neutrality. Regardless of a stiff opposition to her nomination, the Senate is required to at least consider President Buhari's request and the Committee on INEC is all set to screen the controversial nominee. Yeah, committee yeah. members head straight to the crux of the matter, asking her to respond to the petitions against her as regards her affiliation with the ruling APC. Are you a current member of any political party, madam? Since 2019, when President Mohamed Buhari won his second term, I have removed myself from anything political. So when APC decided and decided to do a proper registration of their members and to revalidate their membership, I did not take part in that exercise. Another issue which stood against the nominee centered on whether or not her nomination as a second candidate from Delta State violates the principle of federal character. Mrs. May Abamuchembo is from Delta State, but she was nominated she's married to somebody from cross river state and she was nominated to represent cross river state not delta state the nominee's response on her affiliation with the apc does not convince some committee members and a back and forth ensues you swore to an oath an affidavit rather in the high court of the federal capital territory in paragraph three of that affidavit it said that I am also engaged in active politics. I am also a member of the All Progressives Congress. There is nothing wrong I can see in the appointment of Madam as INEC National Commission. All the points, according to the petitions I read, most of them are sentiments. Madam Onoche, the place on oath to repeat what she said as to whether or not She's a member of a political party. If we only put somebody on oath in a committee, if we were having a, if, if, if there was a, there, there was an investigation, we are not investigating. This is not an investigative hearing. Mrs. Loretta Onoche takes her leave after an intense screening process. The committee is expected to make its recommendation to the Senate on her nomination for the position. Linda Kibi, Channels Television News. Two security matters. Bandits have attacked Ungwan Matari, Sabon Tasha, and Chekun local government area of Kaduna State, kidnapping no fewer than 14 people. The bandits were said to have invaded the community, which is adjoining Bayi Villa, towards Romi River at about 11 in the evening of Wednesday. They began shooting sporadically before moving to some houses where they kidnapped residents. The incident occurred barely three hours after more than 121 students of Bethel Baptist School in Chikun local government area were abducted by bandits on Monday. But the immediate past chairman of Chikun local government area, Mr. Samaila Lehman, told our correspondent that a total of 14 members of the community were kidnapped by bandits and taken away to an unknown destination. Meanwhile, the Inspector General of Police, Sir Mr. Usman Al-Khali Baba, has also been speaking on the security situation in Kaduna State as he paid a visit to the State Governor and the State Police Command. 
I'm here on a courtesy call on the governor of Kaduna State, His Excellency Mala Mohamed Al Rufai. While on a familiarization tour to my to the command, so I paid him a court call, but uh, we have only used the visit to discuss issues relating to security and how we will go about it to make life easier for law abiding citizens of this state. It is through lack of manpower is a challenge. We are making effort to overcome it, but you know, challenges are always there. They are surmountable. We will use what we have to the best of our knowledge and ability to, to do better. But very soon we will overcome the issues regarding the challenges of having the increase in manpower. I just reminded the latest kidnap happened barely three days after the incident in Bethel Baptist School. In the meantime, in Yobe State, troops of Sector 2 Joint Task Force of Operation Hadinkai have arrested a notorious Boko Haram ISWAP member for carrying out espionage on troops in the general area of Katako Village. The Director, Army Public Relations Brigadier General Onyema Wachuku, in a statement, says the gallant troops also repelled an attack on Katako village in Gujba local government area of Yobe state. According to him, during preliminary investigation, an informant identified as Abo Kawu confessed to having monitored and disclosed troops' location and movement to the terrorists and revealed that more Boko Haram collaborators have been deployed to the general area to spy on the troops. The statement as of the revelation placed the troops on red alert as efforts are ongoing to unravel the network of informants within the general area. The chairman of Nigeria's Governor's Forum, Governor Kayode Fayemi of Ikiti State, is advocating the need for an all-inclusive security strategy that recognizes modern realities in the fight against insecurity in the country. The governor made the call at a peace and security conference in Abuja organized by the Nigeria Governors Forum Secretariat. According to him, there's urgent need to address issues and situations that drive insecurity rather than just concentrating on arms confrontations. Governor Fayemi Kayode arrives at the venue of the Nigeria Governors Forum's Peace and Inclusive Security Initiative in Abuja. It is an initiative of the Forum Secretariat to provide a platform to discuss solutions to the rising security problem in the country. We have the case of youth vulnerability and exclusion. The keynote speaker who joins the conversations virtually highlights the reasons why insecurity thrives in the country. Most, if not all security challenges facing Nigeria, are the inevitable outcomes of the accumulated neglect of the entrenched flaws inherent for the policy. Right from independence, we had false understanding of what a nation should be. And we do not make any serious attempt to build cohesion among the various, the various groups that come together to form the entity called Nigeria. Beyond identifying some of these key drivers of insecurity, the chairman of Nigeria Governors Forum calls for an urgent need to change strategy just well, as the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto State faults previous approaches to addressing the country's security problem. The orientation that previously governed the operation of our security agencies have been tailored to address the perceived dangers of yesteryears. And that clearly is now out of date. And I remember a year or two after Boko Haram, I wrote an article which was published, I think, in this day or The Guardian. And the title was bread, not bullets. And the point I was trying to argue was that if we turn this crisis into a military operation, we're going to be in trouble. Security concern is rising in Nigeria. And for some of the participants at this conference, this is not a problem that can be addressed by guns and bullets alone. Although the Nigerian government has intensified efforts to tackle the security and near humanitarian crisis, there are serious underlying socioeconomic issues that the solution to revenue requires more than just the security action. Ultimately, how well we respond to the security challenge depends on the level of collaboration between all of our actors, state and non-state. Insecurity is a major problem that both the states and the federal government are contending with, and the implications of the deteriorating situation 
no doubt calls for a more decisive action. In part two after the break, federal government vows to go tough on airlines and other organizations over 37 billion naira debt owed its aviation agencies. So join us again. If you've just joined us to watch the news at 10 live on channels television Lagos, a reminder of our top stories. Pandemonium breaks out at the Emo State House of Assembly as Speaker announces removal of the Chief Whip and suspension of six other lawmakers. Senate screens candidates for appointment as INEC National Commissioners. Controversial nominee Loretta Onochie denies being a member of the ruling party, the APC. Three days after the 120 students of Bethel Baptist School were abducted in Chikun local government area in Kaduna State, at least 14 people have again been kidnapped in the same area. And four suspects killed as manhunt continues for other persons believed to have been involved in the assassination of Haiti's president, Jovenel Moise. The preliminary report on the Nigerian Air Force Beechcraft King Air 350i, which crashed, killing the former Chief of Army staff and 11 others on May 21st, 2021, will be released next week, but it will be at the discretion of the Air Force to either make it public or not. This is made known by the Chief Executive Officer of the Accident Investigation Bureau, Aking Olateru, while releasing eight aircraft accident reports and nine safety recommendations between the year 2010 and 2019. He asked that while one is classified as an accident, seven others are classified as serious accidents with two international dimension reports. Meanwhile, the federal government is raising concern over a 37 billion naira debt owed by airlines. The Minister of Aviation, Senator Hadi Sirika, told a media conference today that the airlines owe agencies like Nigeria Airspace Management Agency, Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority, Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria, among several agencies in the aviation sector. Senator Sirika adds that the figure is an accumulation that spans over 13 years and contributes to the poor management of uh, the aviation sector. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Mezuki, reports. The challenges within the Nigeria's aviation space, including a 37 billion naira debt owed the federal government, is whipped up by the Minister of Aviation at this week's ministerial briefing. About 37 billion that they're owing, especially Arik, the culprit, I know they are owing us about maybe 13, 14 billion. If you are owing government, they are owing fund. The Bakotni, um, that's the Babalakin, right? The Bakotni is owing, I think, about 14 billion as the last count. He's not paid a single dime from the time he started uh, to run that terminal building. And we have not ceased giving him electricity water, fire cover, and so on and so forth. He hasn't paid a dime for 13 years. And if we go to shut his doors, the media, of course, and Nigerian people will say we're killing businesses. But he's killing our services too. Because we have to have that money to provide for that toilet that you're looking for in Lagos Airport. So we have to earn money. Most of this are living by the IGRs, and so we need the money. The aviation minister also believes the development of Nigeria's aviation sector is consequent upon the concessioning of airports, which would not amount to job loss. We will not allow this infrastructure to keep dilapidating and not earning money. We will ensure that we give you the best of infrastructure, put it in the hands of um, the private sector, who understand the business, run it, and pay government a return back the infrastructure back to the people because we are social democrats in power. Under the present administration, he notes that a total of 67 final aviation accident reports have been released from 2007 to 2016 to ensure transparency in airline accident investigations. 
the aviation minister is attributing frequent airline collapse to poor capacity to manage. As a matter of fact, he insists that passengers enforce their rights by demanding full refund after a two-hour delayed flight to further entrench sanity into the system. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. To the legislature, the House of Representatives has mandated its Committee on Police Affairs to liaise with the Nigeria Police Force to investigate, apprehend and prosecute killers of the Director General of the Scientific Equipment Development Institute in Inugu, Professor Samuel Ndubisi. This follows a motion of urgent public importance raised by the Deputy Minority Leader, Toby Okechukwu. Meanwhile, President Mamadou Buhari has transmitted the medium-term expenditure framework 2022 to 2024 and fiscal strategy paper to the House of Representatives, just as the House approved the federal government's loan request of $6.1 billion. Staying in the FCT, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control has confirmed the index case of the Delta variant of the coronavirus in Nigeria. The NCDC said in a statement that the variant was detected during routine tests for inbound travelers in the nation's capital. According to the NCDC, the Delta variant is recognized by the World Health Organization as a variant of concern given its increased transmissibility and has been detected in over 90 countries in the world and is expected to spread to more countries. The variant has also been linked to a surge in cases in countries where it is the dominant strain in circulation. The NCDC statement says that there are ongoing studies to understand the impact of the variant on existing vaccines and therapeutics. The recommended control measures to limit the spread of the Delta variant, according to the NCDC, remains testing following existing public health guidance and abiding by current travel and public restrictions. In electoral matters, the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, says the commission hopes to register over 100 million voters ahead of the next general election in 2023. Professor Mahmoud stated this at a meeting with a delegation of the Malawian Electoral Commission, whose members are in Nigeria, to understudy the country's electoral system. According to him, the introduction of an online registration portal, as well as the recent expansion of the number of polling units, will no doubt help to raise the number of eligible registered voters in the country. Uh, we have succeeded in expanding uh, voter access from the 119,974 polling units we had to 176,872 polling units today. We will share this happy experience with you. Uh, we are a huge country. Um, in terms of registered voters, we have the largest database of registered voters in Africa. We just now over 84 million, and our hope is that from the ongoing continuous registration of voters, we'll register at least 20 million more Nigerians, and that will take the register to well over 100 million um, by the time we go into the next general election, which is less than two years away. From today is going to happen in 2023. We have just concluded the expansion of voter access to polling units in Nigeria after 25 years of unsuccessful attempts. And we are also in the middle of um, voter registration. In Malawi, I know that you have been trying to delimit constituencies since 1998, more or less for the same reason that Nigeria has not succeeded in delimiting constituencies, but more, most especially the polling units. So we'll share experiences with you. River State Governor Yesum Wike has commissioned a five-bedroom duplex in the old GRA in Port Harker to serve as the official residence of the Speaker of the State House of Assembly. During the commission of the building, the Governor commended the cordial relations between the executive and the legislative arms in River State. 
It's a great moment for Governor Yeson Wike as he commissions the official residence of the Speaker of the River State House of Assembly. A five bedroom, fully furnished duplex with beautiful features and landscape. <laughs> The leader of the state's legislature believes the governor's disposition and developmental strides promotes the image of the state. What I'm doing here is setting the record for others to know that Governor Yeso Nwike in his administration has been able to carry River State. And today, outside River State, River State is even more discussed in public places outside the state, positively. <laughs> Governor Wike sees this gesture as a demonstration of the cordial relationship with all arms of government. He also notes that only those who prioritize the people's interests will get his support in their political aspiration. I will not support anybody who cannot move River State forward. I will not. I won't. I will support those who mean well for this state and who have the heart of the party to continue to support the party. That is those I will support. Anybody who thinks that you will use uh, blackmail to, to, to say anything, don't waste your time. It will not work. It will not work. So I will do the right thing and nothing less than that. I will do the right thing. Before commissioning the building, the special guest and former deputy speaker of the House of Representatives, Austin Opara, commends the governor while bearing his mind on the importance of the legislative arm of government to nation building. The people are asking, amend the Electoral Act. And in amending the Electoral Act, provide for electronic transmission of results. That's what the people are asking for. Why would you not listen to the calls and the cry of the people? So we are indeed urging our colleagues in the National Assembly, the Senate and the House, please listen to the cries of the people. The glory of God will commission it in the name of God the Father, the God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The residence is commissioned as the special guest and other dignitaries take a tour of the apartment. The inauguration is part of events to mark Governor Wike's sixth year in office as he winds down the seven weeks' activities in a few days with an account of stewardship. When the news of Ted returns, Federal Inland Revenue Service directs designated money banks to freeze and recover 1.8 trillion naira from the accounts of Multi Choice Nigeria and Multi Choice Africa. We'll have more business news. Join us again. Welcome back to the News at 10. Off to Abuja studio now, where Terry Kumi is standing by with more on the News at 10. Hi, Terry. Hello, Amarachi. The president has appointed chancellors for 42 federal universities in the country with the honor of Ife, Oba Adeye Yogunusi, the Sultan of Sokoto, Mohammed Sa'ad Abubakar, and the Obi of Onitsha, Nemeka Achebe, among the newly appointed chancellors. The Sultan is now the Chancellor of the University of Ibadan. The Oni is the Chancellor of the University of Nigeria and Suka, while the Obi of Onitsha is appointed Chancellor of Amadou Bello University, Zaria. The President also approved the appointment of Pro-Chancellors and Chairman of Councils of 23 federal universities and four inter-university centers. All the Chancellors include the Oba of Benin, Obayawari II, who was the Chancellor of Bayero University, Kanu, the Asagba of Asaba, Chike Edozian, now Chancellor of the Federal University of Gashua, Yobe State. The Etsu of Nupe, Yahaya Abubakar, is the Chancellor of the Obafemiya Wolowo University, Leife, while the Atao of Igala is the Chancellor of the Federal University, Oyekiti. To the judiciary now, the Federal High Court in Abuja has granted bail to the former Registrar of JAMP, Professor Adedibu Ojerinde, in the sum of 200 million naira and two charities in like sum, who also must be resident in the FCT. Justice Obiora Eguatu ordered that one of the charities must be a professor in a federal university, 
and the other a property owner in Abuja. The residencies of the sureties must be verified by the prosecution ICPC. The judge also ordered that he deposits his international passport with the court. Professor Jerinde is facing an 18-count charge bordering on diversion of public funds estimated at over 5.2 billion naira. The case has been adjourned to 22nd July for trial. The Kano state government has provided two 18-seater buses for Nigerian Union of Journalists and the Correspondent Chapel in the state. While handing over the buses to journalists at the government house, Governor Omar Ganduji urged them to be professional in discharging their duties as they play a major role in the nation's social development. A correspondent, Nanchin Vincent, reports. It's a good day for journalists in Kano as the state government moves to support members of the fourth estate of the realm. Realizing that effective logistics will enable members of the press in the state perform their duties more efficiently, Governor Ganduje decides to provide the journalists with two 18-seater buses. <laughs> While handing over the buses at the government house in Kano, the governor says the gesture is in recognition of the consistency and contributions of journalists to development in the state. We believe members of the Nigerian Union of Journalists, they are playing a very, very important role in the national unity and national integration in this country. They all know our ideology. They all know where we are going. And they all know our belief that our diversity in Nigeria should be regarded as an advantage, not as a challenge and not as a misnomer. So we are providing with the, these vehicles not because all their members are from Kano or they belong to the same tribe or they belong to the same religion. That is not the issue. The issue is the core function that they do to the society. For the Kano State Commissioner for Information, Mohamed Garba, the gesture is well targeted. We realize that most of the major challenge they are having is because their vehicle has been old and they will not be able to follow the convoy of His Excellency the Governor. The journalists describe the Governor's gesture as honorable. As rightly put by the Honorable Commissioner of Information, it was 12 years ago that we witnessed such an occasion. And now history is repeating itself. Grateful for the support from the executive, members of the press in Kano say they will put the buses to good use. And that's all from the nation's capital. Let's go back to Lagos for business news with Anne Waudu. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Terry. Let's start business news with the Federal Inland Revenue Service having directed commercial banks in Nigeria to freeze the accounts of MultiChoice Nigeria Limited and MultiChoice Africa in a bid to recover about 1.8 trillion Naira outstanding taxes. In a statement released today, the FIRS says it discovered that the company is persistently breaching all agreements while the group's performance did not reflect in its tax obligations and compliance level in the country. The FIRS further explains the Multi-Choice Africa, which provides services to its Nigerian subsidiary, had never paid value-added tax to the Nigerian government since inception, even as the country contributes 34% of the total revenue from the Multi-Choice Group. Meanwhile, Multi-Choice Nigeria, in a statement, says that it has not received any notification from FIRS, adding that it respects and complies with tax laws of Nigeria. The only way to effectively reduce the cost of cement in the country is to have more players in the subsector. And that's according to Mr. Abdul Samad Rabiu, the chairman of Boa Cement PLC, one of Nigeria's leading cement companies at the company's fifth annual general meeting held in the nation's capital, Abuja. It's been a great year so far for one of Nigeria's leading cement companies, Boa Cement PLC. 
This fifth annual general meeting is to update shareholders on how the company has performed at the year ending 2020 and the auditors are satisfied with the books. The company's statement of financial position and statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income are in agreement with those books and returns. Bua Cement PLC is declaring a profit after tax of 72.3 billion naira, over 12 billion naira more than it declared in 2019, paying a higher dividend of 70 billion naira to shareholders, that is 2.067 naira per share of 50 kobo each, to the delight of the shareholders. Our products are still hot cake. They are in demand. You cannot go to any shop and see Bua Cement on ground, because as soon as the trailer comes, People pack all. I want to commend the growth in our revenue by 19.35 percent from 175 billion naira to 209 billion naira. Bua Cement managed to make more profit in a difficult 2020 while still adhering to its policy on social development and community improvement by giving charity to communities totaling 753.7 million naira. The company's chairman wants more players in the cement industry if Nigeria is to meet the market demand, which will in turn drive down the price of cement in the country. If you look at what is happening in Egypt today, Egypt is producing 85 million tons of cement. The demand for cement in Egypt is just under 50 million tons. Hence the reason why Egypt today is probably, you know, has the cheapest, you know, our price in terms of cement here in Africa. We should do the same, and I think government and you know should encourage more players because it's so critical, it's so important. And if you only if you have only three players and there is a problem or issue with any of the players, for whatever reason, you know I mean we'll see the price of cement going much higher than what it is today. Investors are rest assured that Bua Cement is poised to make them more profit come the end of 2021 as the company plans to mop up more limestone deposits, breaking ground in more parts of the country, and perhaps exceed the demand of 60 million tons of cement per year. The stock market closed today on a negative note as the all share index fell by 0.08% to close to the trading session. Any John Mekwa tells us more. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Well, after four sessions of staying behind the curtains, the bear resurfaced at the end of today's trading. But it's no cause for alarm because what we see is that investors dived into the market for profit taking, leading to an increase of 0.79 in the value of trade for today when compared to yesterday. The value for today stood at 2.58 billion naira in 3,927 deals. Top trade by value, two tier one lenders, Zenith and GTCO, both accounted for over 600 of today's deals. Sectoral activity had a lot of profit taking in the banking sector. It was down by almost 1%, although the oil and gas sector mitigated the losses. The sector gained over 1%. About 27 billion naira was shaved off the equities market at the end of trading. But not to worry. Hopefully, the markets will gain it back. That's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawodo. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Amarachi. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Anne. The visitor to the University of Lagos, President Mamadou Buhari, has promised to engage Nigerian scholars in the development of the nation. The president was represented by the executive secretary of the Nigeria Universities Commission at the 2019 convocation ceremony of the Foremost University. Four eminent Nigerians were also decorated with honorary doctorate degrees for their contributions to social and educational development. The final day of the 51st convocation of the University of Lagos is a roll call of dignitaries. President Mohamed Buhari is represented by the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Universities Commission, Professor Adamu Rashid, Governor of Borono State, Baba Gana Zulum, and his predecessor, Senator Kashim Shatima, 
chairman of the Dangote Group, Alhaji Aleko Dangote, founder of Zenith Bank, Jim Ovia, traditional rulers, members of the diplomatic corps, and many other eminent Nigerians. The ceremony signifies the official conferment of Doctor of Philosophy degrees on successful candidates, conferment of posthumous emeritus professorship on the former and eighth vice chancellor of the university, Professor Uyewusi Bidakbobe. The event is to also confer posthumous honorary degree on late Dr. Stella Adadevo, a Nigerian heroine who saved the nation from the Ebola epidemic in 2014. Advertising magnate and chairman of Trika Holdings, Dr. Bjordan Shobanjo, entrepreneur and philanthropist Alhaji Muhammadu Indimi, and businessman and philanthropist Sir Kessington Adibutu are also on the lineup for award for their contribution to social and educational development. These eminently qualified Nigerians who have touched numerous lives and contributed immensely to the society. We are painstakingly selected by Senate and Council. When their citations are read, I am sure you will understand why they were chosen. The Pro Chancellor calls for the support of everyone to enable him deliver on his mission to raise the bar at the university. I am very committed to this assignment, and together with other council members, we have hit the ground running to ensure University of Lagos becomes first amongst equal and indeed a truly 21st century world-class university. And to the awards of the honorary doctorate degrees. While the widow of the former vice chancellor takes the stage to stand in for her husband, Bankole Cardozo is taking the posthumous honor on his mother, Dr. Adadevo. In this hall are 148 PhD degree holders, the highest in the history of the university. The awardees consider this conferment an honor. Let me start by publicly thanking once again the governor of Borno State for the human stars he's performing in that part of our country. I have never met him before, but I watch him on television. And his commitment and is, in fact, he goes the whole hall, including wanting to lay down his own life for his people. I wish we have many more governors like Governor Zoom. I promise to raise the bar of good governance. In concrete, measurable, and quantum value to the electorate, inshallah. The leadership of the Alumni Association admits the graduates who are joining the over 300,000 others doing the school proud. I congratulate our young men and women who have received their first degrees earlier in the week for surviving the obstacles, hardships and all manner of discouragement. For the 2019 and 51st Convocation Ceremony of the University of Lagos, a total of 15,753 students graduate, 49.2% of them first degrees, and the rest 50.8% postgraduate. Police in Haiti are still engaged in a manhunt for killers of President Jovenel Moïse in the country's capital, Port-au-Prince. Police Chief Leon Charles says four suspects have been killed and two others detained. Simon Pusey has more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. A deadly gun battle between police and the men suspected of assassinating Haiti's President Jovenel Moise has been raging in Port-au-Prince. 
The country's police chief announced that security forces had shot dead four of the suspected attackers and captured two more. Mr Moise was fatally shot and his wife was injured when attackers stormed their home early on Wednesday. The government has declared a two-week state of emergency as it chases down the remaining killers. Japan has declared a state of emergency in Tokyo, which will run throughout the Olympic Games, while organizers have also considered banning all spectators from attending. Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga told reporters it would remain in place until the 22nd of August, but he did not give details on the restrictions. Coronavirus infections are rising in Tokyo as the 23rd of July opening ceremony edges closer. There has been widespread opposition to the Games in Japan and calls for them to be postponed or cancelled. Russia has offered North Korea COVID vaccines once again amid reports that a harsh lockdown is leading to extreme hunger. Pyongyang has refused vaccines and aid from a number of countries. It has instead sealed borders to try and keep the virus out, but that has affected trade with China as it relies on Beijing for food, fertilizer and fuel. Kim Jong-un has acknowledged that the country is facing food shortages, describing the situation as tense. Officials have announced they believe there is now zero chance of finding any survivors from the collapsed apartment building in Florida. At this point, we have truly exhausted every option available to us. Rescue teams are switching from a search and rescue mission to a recovery effort. The decision comes about two weeks after the 12-story Champlain Towers south fell in the middle of the night. 54 victims have been found and 86 are still missing. No survivors have been found since the initial collapse and rescue crews say many victims were found in their beds. Afghan troops have recaptured government buildings in a western city which was attacked by the Taliban. <laughs> Afghan special forces carried out operations to drive Taliban fighters out of Kunduz city as the war reached the gates of the provincial capital. The Islamist insurgents have been advancing for weeks, an offensive that has accelerated as the United States pulled out of its main base in Afghanistan, effectively ending its two-decade intervention. A U.S. court has suspended Rudy Giuliani from practicing law in Washington, D.C. amid fallout over his baseless claims about the 2020 election. All the, oh my goodness, all the networks! The move comes after Giuliani, who led Trump's legal challenge after his election defeat, was also suspended from practicing law in New York last month. A court ruled that he had made demonstrably false and misleading statements to courts, lawmakers and the public in trying to overturn the results of the elections. Giuliani's license will be revoked while disciplinary action over his practices are considered. The Israeli army has destroyed the house of a jailed Palestinian who killed an Israeli teen in a drive-by shooting in May. Flames and smoke emerged from the house in Termasaya after the army blew it up. The military said that the jailed Palestinian opened fire at a busy West Bank intersection, seriously wounding two Israelis. It said he fired from a car near a Jewish settlement before driving off. South Africa's former president, Jacob Zuma, has started serving a 15-month jail sentence for contempt of court. Shortly before a midnight deadline, Mr. Zuma left his homestead in Kandla in a convoy of vehicles to turn himself over to police. Zuma was handed the jail term last week after he failed to attend a corruption inquiry. The former president also faces a separate court case relating to a $2 billion arm deal in 1999. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. And thanks, Simon. The International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach has arrived in Tokyo earlier today with just over two weeks to go before the opening of the Summer Olympics. Mr. Bach waved to journalists from the window of the Tokyo 2020 van that was transporting him as he arrived at his hotel, having earlier arrived at Tokyo's Haneda Airport. And that's sports news. Thanks, Sayotunde. And the main news again. A pandemonium broke out today at the Imo State House of Assembly after Speaker announced the removal of the chief whip and suspension of six other lawmakers. Also today, the Senate screened candidates for appointments as INEC National Commissioner's controversial nominee, Loretta Noche, denied being a member of the ruling party, the APC. And that's it on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Good night.